Hello and good morning, everyone. Welcome to Covenant Community Church. Whether you're tuning with us online or here with us today, we're so glad to have you guys with us. I invite you all to please stand as we worship the one who is worthy of praise, our Lord Jesus Christ. And just one word, you calm the storm that surrounds me. With just one word, the darkness has to retreat. With just one touch, I feel the presence of heaven. With just one touch, my eyes were open to see. My heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that a God can't do. There's not a mountain that he can move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that a God can do. There's nothing that a God can do. And he moves inside me. With just one word, and you revive every dream. With just one touch, I feel the power of heaven. With just one touch, my eyes were open to see. My heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a mountain that He can move. Oh, praise the name that makes the way there's nothing that a god can do oh there's nothing that a god can do there's not a prison wall we can't break through oh praise the name that makes the way there's nothing that a god can do oh For greater things, there's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise, let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise, let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like the power. There's nothing that a God can do. There's not a mountain that he can move. Oh, praise the name that makes the way. There's nothing that a God can do. Oh, there's nothing that a God can do. There's not a prison wall we can't break through. Oh, praise the name that makes the way. There's nothing that a God can do. Oh. There's nothing that a God can
When darkness rise to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I owe When brokenness and pain is all I know Oh, I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Shame no longer has a place to hide. I am not captive to the lies I'm not afraid to leave my past behind Oh, I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in When I stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Oh, there's power that can break off every chain, there's power that can empty out a grave. There's resurrection power that can save There's power in your name Power in your name There's power that can break up every chain There's power that can empty out a grave There's resurrection power that there's power in your name, power in your name. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Oh, I'm standing in your love. Oh. I'm standing on the rock. Oh, I'm standing, I'm standing in your love. Uh, my name is Bruce Mohagen. I'm the elder for missions here at Covenant. And we're happy that you're here worshiping with us this morning and online. Um, in case you haven't heard, uh, the collection we took Christmas Eve for uh, supporting Vaca Fish, a local food bank, we collected $843 that night. So it's pretty good. Um, if you're new here, uh, we want to welcome you and invite you to stop by the Welcome Center on your way out. Uh, we'd love to meet you and the deacons have a gift for you. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, our provider, our maker and protector, through your goodness, we are healthy enough to gather here and worship you or worship in our homes. We ask you to give strength to our healthcare workers 
who have toiled so hard during this pandemic. And we ask you as the great healer to help those who have been afflicted. As we see so many armed conflicts around the world and the threat of more, we ask that you prevail upon the leaders to find peaceful ways to settle their differences and search for common ground. We praise you and thank you for all you have given us and ask that everything we do be done for your glory forever and ever. And now we share the disciples' prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. And the kids can now go to Kidstown. All right, church, as we go to our next song, I invite you to please sit or stand however you feel that.
just want you and nothing else, Jesus, and nothing else, nothing else will do. for loving us unconditionally in spite of us being sinners Lord you do not owe us anything and yet you gave your one and only son so that we could be saved Father as we pray that as Pastor Jordan comes and preach with us today we open our hearts and our minds so that we may be able to discern your word we love you God all of this in Christ's name Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. It's good to be with you all and worship together today. Uh, if I don't know you, my name is Jordan. I am the director of student ministries here, and I have the blessing and uh, truly privilege to be able to preach this morning. Uh, we are continuing our study on the book of Philippians. Uh, Philippians, just as a reminder, is uh, one of Paul's epistles, one of his letters uh, that he wrote. And what makes Philippians unique and what we've been talking about a little bit is typically with Paul's letters, Paul is often addressing an, oh, let me start my timer so I don't keep us too, too, too terribly long. This is a recurring issue that I have. I just lose track of time. I still think it's like 2019. Anyways, the book of Philippians, it's unusual in Paul's letters because no, most of the time when Paul writes a letter, he's writing it for a very a dire need. Uh, there's oftentimes a sort of a corrective issue that needs to be addressed. Uh, for instance, in the book of Romans, there is a conflict of leadership between Jewish leaders in the church and Gentile leaders in the church, which prompts Paul to write uh, theological treaties of sorts to address the uh, problems that are arising from the lack of theological knowledge. Corinthians are encountering all sorts of ethical issues. However, there is no ongoing issue in the church of Philippi. Uh, instead, Paul is simply writing a letter of thanksgiving giving them thanks for uh, a gift that they had sent him while in prison. And so what we get with Philippians, it's, it's much more Paul doing theology just for the sake of doing theology. And Paul uh, expounding on who Christ is just because he wants to. 
And he's, what, what this enables him to do is dive a little deeper with the Philippians because they are mature believers. And so he is able to take them beyond. He, with the Corinthians, he says, I, I'm forced to still give you like baby milk. I want to give you solid food. With the Philippians, he's able to give them solid food. And the way he does this is quite interesting. Most time, Paul's letters have a very complex sort of argument structure. He's building an argument. For instance, the book of Romans has a very complex sort of uh, structure and he leads the Romans through a theological argument, which is, by the way, why if, if any of you guys have ever heard of like the Romans road, a way to like, it's one of those sort of like formulas to save someone, don't use it because it takes Paul's very complex argument and chops it up and places it out of order. He has it in a sequence for a reason. Uh, that's just a freebie on the side. Uh, <laughs> Philippians is different. Philippians is not structured like a typical uh, argument. Uh, Philippians is more orbital. It's structured like a solar system, wherein there are all these sort of thematically connected passages orbiting around a center, and that center is Philippians 2, 6 through 11, which we get to look at today. Today we're looking at Philippians 2, 1 through 11, which is actually my favorite passage in all of Philippians, which is saying something because there's a flat passage in Philippians where Paul cusses, and we're going to get to that, but it's, this stands out as my favorite passage in the book, even despite that. It stands out in my, as my favorite passage in the Bible, actually, which is also saying something because there's a passage called Saul and the Necromancer of Endor in the Old Testament. This stands out even above that for me. And the reason this stands out for me so much is it's become actually what I consider to be the center of Paul's theology. It is the way through which Paul views Christ. He is going to, in this passage, he's going to try and communicate a dire imperative to the Philippians, something that is a huge drive for them, something that he really wants them to do. And to give reason for that, he is going to move into a hymn uh, he's going to restructure what we think may have been a song that was sung by the very early church. He's going to restructure and repurpose it to communicate something very profound about the nature of Christ that by doing so actually communicates something even more profound about the nature of God himself and how we respond to that. So without further ado, let's get into the word, but let's, let's pray before we do. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we ask that as we read and as we study, you would illuminate your word to us that we may be more like you just as you became like us. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Paul says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort in his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion... Then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. We're going to stop there for a second. So, Paul sets up this sort of conditional clause. Therefore, if, he says, if you have any encouragement from being united in Christ, this is sort of a, a trick condition because the answer is, yeah, we do. So, he says, if you have this, then complete my joy. So, the answer, it's, it's more rhetorical. Yes, we do have encouragement of Christ. Therefore, the Philippians are supposed to respond to that encouragement by, I'm afraid, I, I'm going to move this back a little bit without hopefully knocking stuff over because I'm afraid I'm going to like barrel into it. I'm going to get, I think I'm going to get animated and just flop around and I don't want to like hit that and fall over and injure myself. It's probably hilarious and YouTube viral as that would go. Where was I? <laughs> Philippians, that's right. He's saying, so if you have this encouragement in Christ, you have a task to do with that. Complete my joy, he says. 
And so this is, this is important for us to realize. Uh, he, he says, complete his joy. What is going to be the thing that completes Paul's joy? As he's approaching the end of his life, as he's in prison, and he's wondering if maybe he's approaching the time of his execution, he is saying there's something that would make his joy complete. This is continuing sort of themes and motifs running through this book of joy. Joy despite circumstances is a continual theme that pops up in Philippians. But also the idea of things being brought into completion. This is a book that is all about maturing in faith. And so Paul is saying, you can do this for me, Philippians church, and how do you do it? How, what would be Paul's greatest joy at this point in his life, it is simply unity. Unity. The title of today's message is Unity in the Mind of Christ, Cruciformity. And we, were gonna, we were gonna unpack what that means a little bit, but let's start with this idea of unity. Paul calls them to unity. He says, being like-minded, having the same love, being of one spirit and of one mind. Unity. This is, unity is one of the non-negotiables of Christian life. To be united to one another is, ironically, one of the non-negotiables, because it's one of the things we're most bad at. Now, there, there's some questions sometimes of what does this mean, because Paul calls them to be like-minded. In some translation, it says to be of the same mind, which leads some to the conclusion that we're all supposed to think the same, right? At all times, we're supposed to have the same ideas, same thoughts. Uh, we're supposed to be like all little, like nice carbon copies of each other, but that is not what he is saying. The Greek word he uses here is phreneo. Uh, we're gonna have to talk about uh, quite a bit of Greek today, so strap in. Just, I know there's no, nothing anyone likes more than Greek at 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning. But hey, just uh, can I, just, I had, when I was in Bible college, I had Greek Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 8 a.m., Greek 2. It was, that was suffering for Christ. <laughs> but I'm, I'm alive. I made it. Anyways, the Greek word here is phreneo, which, which can mean mind. Um, it has a variety of meanings. Greek words do not have static meanings. If, if you hear someone say, like, agape, the Greek word for love, always means unconditional love. That's wrong. It, the Greek words don't have static meanings. They're very contextual. They're very fluid. They, they morph a lot. But here, what's important to, to pay attention to is sometimes biblical writers will use a specific word and they'll repeat it specifically uh, in, in a specific book. And here, Paul continues to use this word for mind. There's different words for mind he could use, but he's repeating this word. For mind. He used it in chapter one to say, it is right for me to have this phreneo about you, for me to think this way about you. In other words, the way Paul is using this word in this context is how we are judging others, the conclusions that we are drawing about, about people. And so what Paul is saying is not that I want you all to think the same intellectually, but in your mindset of how you approach others and the world around you to be united in the way you think about people. To be united in the way you think about people. This is further emphasized by Paul calling them to be of the same love. In other words, don't all think the same, no. We, we can't all think the same. We are all created differently and diversely with different ways of thinking, different mindsets, and that is a good thing. But underneath that, there needs to be the same mindset of approaching others, which is one of love. This is radical, even today, to say that we do not all need to think the same, but that our attitude and mindset with which we approach others needs to be the same. And Paul expands on this a little further to dive into what this practically looks like. Um, he says, do not function, in the ESV translation, it says, I like the way they translate it, do not function out of rivalry or conceit. Do not function out of rivalry or conceit. In the NIV, which we have up there, it says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. 
In other words, what does it look like to approach others with a mindset of love, to be united in that? It is to put off your mind of opposition in order to embrace them and look out for their own self-interest, not your own. This is a huge, huge problem today, right? We, we like to divide based on our intellectual ideas. Probably now more so in American society than ever before is a time of divisiveness. It is a time where literally based on intellectual concepts, most time politically, or we're Republican or a Democrat, and we choose our, we'll often choose our candidates based on that they oppose the other side rather than that we're for them, right? We function out of rivalry. We function out of conceit, looking to our own interests. And I, I, this mindset of looking to our own interests and functioning out of opposition to the other, I, I, and I say this very literally, it is biblically satanic. Biblically satanic. What do I mean by that? The Hebrew word satan is not a name. So when we see the word Satan pop up, that's not a being, that's a title. It's very important. It's an important distinction. The devil is a being. Satan is just a title that is often prescribed to the devil. And what it means is to oppose, to be a rival, to be an adversary, to be satanic is to be selfishly oppositionary, to be selfishly adversarial. That is what is satanic. When, when I was growing up and a kid, there was uh, the, you know, the satanic scare where everyone was scared about like, uh, like Dungeons and Dragons and stuff like that. Um, which, you know, okay, but that, that's, okay, you can, you can freak out about that if you want, but biblically, what is truly satanic is not, is, is, is not all of that, but what is, what is satanic is the heart of, oppos of selfish opposition to others. That is what is satanic, according to scripture. That's, that is the devil's problem. That's what causes him to oppose God, is that he just wants what is best for himself and will oppose the good. Paul says, don't. Don't be that way. Don't fall into the satanic trap, but instead, instead of that rivalry, rather in humility, value others above yourselves. ESV translates it, count others more significant than yourself. Wow. That is so countercultural right now. Count others more significant than yourself. Can you even, that's hard to even imagine. People functioning in that way, to count others as more significant. And yet that is what Paul calls believers to. He calls them to a mindset of humility that genuinely thinks of others as better than themselves. Christians are not called to be the people who have it, who, who get it, and who have it all together. That's not supposed to be what defines Christians. What is supposed to be what defines Christians, they are the ones who are simply looking out for others. This makes me think of Jeremiah 29. Right? We, all, we all are familiar with Jeremiah 29, 11. It's on a lot of, I have it on a coffee mug. It's on a lot of coffee mugs, a lot of coffee mugs. You go into a Christian bookstore and it is just coffee mugs with Jeremiah 29, 11. We miss the point a lot of times. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it, it's, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you. And first off, we, we forget that English doesn't have really a second person plural pronoun. Um, and so we often read that as it's to me specifically when it's, it's plural, it's referring to a collective. It's, it, it would be better in the Southern. I know the plans I have for you all. Okay. That's just a good, good exegesis. When you read the Bible, read it in Southern dialect. Whenever you see you, replace it with y'all and you're gonna read the Bible a lot better. 
But the context of Jeremiah 29 is Jeremiah telling exiled Israelites, hey, you lost. And you have a whole bunch of prophets telling you to fight, to fight this new culture, to fight Babylon. They're wrong. Don't do that. Instead, settle down. Build houses. Make babies. Plant gardens. Plant vineyards. Share the fruits of your garden. Share wine with your neighbors. Seek the welfare of the city that you find yourself in because their well-being is your well-being. That is what's going to define God's people. Not that they are rebels. Not that they are trying to overthrow Babylon, but that they are actually seeking the betterment of their neighborhoods. And this is what Paul is calling Christian community to, is to not be the people of opposition, but to be the people of humility. And what is his theological reasoning for this? And now we get to it. It says, in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Now we get to it. He begins to move them into a theological explanation. He tells them to have the mind of Christ, the mindset of Christ. And he says, um, in the ESV it captures this as well, it is yours in Christ Jesus. It belongs to you. You have it. This is a reality that is yours to possess. The mind of Christ is something that belongs by the nature of what Christ has done to all believers. It is ours for the taking. We just sometimes don't take it. We don't live into that reality. It's like in, it's like we live in the matrix. Sorry, my nerd is gonna show a couple times today. The reality is there, we're just not always awake to it. But the mind of Christ, Christian, is there and it is accessible to you. Sometimes I, I've encountered this before where I will, talk, I, I will say something about, well, Jesus did this, and I'll hear people say, well, that's because he was Jesus, so he could. Like Jesus cheated. <laughs> like he had, he had like an upper hand. And that's missing the point, which as we will see from the passage that follows, Jesus did not cheat. Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father. Now, we need to do some grammar work because, yay! <laughs> Who loves participles? Okay, so this I, I found out this morning I have a laser pointer. So, of course I'm going to use it. Now, I've been, I've been kind of pra praising the ESV translation for some of their work, but I actually very much disagree with their translation of this passage, and I think the NIV does a great job. By the way, read a lot of translations. There's no right translation. There's no wrong translation. They're all pretty good. Greek is complex, and we need a variety of English translations to understand it. Now, so Paul here introduces a relative clause, who. He then uses a participle, uh, you guys remember high school English, what a participle is? Um, a participle is a verb that is being sort of used as an adjective sometimes or as a substantive noun. Um, I know, the guys, this is super exciting, right? Paul is here using a participial form of a verb for being, a verb for existence. This is a rare thing. This doesn't often happen. And what's even more rare is he's not using the common word 
for being, which is a me in Greek. He is using a, a different word, uh, uh, hupakarno, I think. I'm messing up on the pronunciation. Don't tell my Greek professor. Um, and he's doing this, I think, purposefully to draw attention to this word because it's odd. He could have actually left the word out entirely, but he's drawing attention to it. Now, the ESV and a lot of other translations will insert a word here in between the who and being. Who, although being in very nature God. Now, they're, so they're inserting a conjunction. You guys remember Schoolhouse Rock's conjunction, junction, was you looking upwards? Yeah, a conjunction to connect those two clauses. It's, it's, they put it in there to sort of smooth out, but also to draw a theological idea out, right? That who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality God something to be used, but made himself a servant. Um, they're putting a conjunction in there to draw contrast between the idea of being in nature God and taking on the form of a servant. You guys see that? So the although creates a sense of contrast. That's not in the Greek. That word is not there. Okay? This is actually a much more wooden translation, who being nature of God. He's using a verb of being to describe the state of Jesus. Now, I think this captures the, what's going on in the Greek really well, but I think there's a further implication behind this that actually this doesn't capture. And so, which is why when my, my translation of it, actually the, the, G, the JUV, the Jordan unofficial version, <laughs> reads, who because he was in the nature of God. I know that was a lot of grammar, but the point is, the participle here doesn't imply contrast, but causality. The participle here doesn't imply contrast, but causality. In other words, to empty himself and take on the form of a servant is not in contrast to who God is, but because of it. That is profound. This is what makes this one of the most profound passages in all of scripture is that Paul is saying that it is because he was God that he became human, not in contrast to his godhood but exactly because of it. That's who God is. Let that sink in. The God of the universe, Yahweh, Elohim, I am that I am, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, the creator, is fundamentally, by nature, a God who does not consider his godlike status something to be taken advantage of, but by nature gives it up. That is what Paul is saying about Christ and by extension, God. Because Jesus does not do anything except what he sees the Father doing. God, from the beginning, has been humbling himself. The very act of creation, of creating minds other than his own, is an, and imbuing those minds with his image is an act of incarnational humility. From the beginning, God has been humbling himself. And in the personhood of Christ, he takes this humility to its, its fullest extension and its most natural extension to the point that he counts others more significant than himself by going to the cross. And this, this is why Christ teaches the way he does. We often at times have a bad habit of only looking at 
Christ's life for the purpose of looking at the cross, forgetting much of his teaching. This is the theological reasoning why Christ teaches the first shall be last and the last shall be first. This is why God consistently throughout scripture gives preferential treatment to the poor, the oppressed, and the downtrodden because that's the side God naturally places himself on. We serve a self-emptying God. We serve a God of loving humility that will take that loving humility to the extreme because that's who he is. This is why the, the temptation of Christ plays out the way he does. Think of the temptation of Christ. Jesus, weak, in a weakened state in the wilderness, a state of solitude, is, encounters the Satan, the opposer, the one of rivalrous opposition, the one of self-interest, who tempts him to self-interest. He says, turn these stones to bread. And Bible scholars have talked about these temptations. They are all representations of actually tempt he's being tempted to power. Turn these stones to bread. What can you do with that? Well, you can manipulate the masses. You give them bread and they will follow you. Caesar did the same thing. He would pack people into the Colosseum and then toss out bread to them, to control them. And for sure, Christ, Christ does give bread, but not to manipulate, but to meet need. But for the sake of self-interest, Jesus says, no, I will not use food, nor resources, nor economics for my own power. That is not who I am. He's taken to the temple top and said, and told, throw yourself off of it. The angels will come, and they will capture you, and, and remember, this is the Bible. These aren't little cherub angels, like little baby angels with the wings. These are biblically accurate angels with wings and eyeballs all over the place in places where there should not be eyeballs, and it would have been scary and terrifying and awe-inspiring, and people would have seen Christ flying with angels at his side from the temple, the housing place of God, and said, this is it. This is the Messiah. It is a temptation to power by fame. And Jesus says, no. In contrast, his ministry, he is often called the secret Messiah. Because people will clue in, they'll be like, oh, you're, the, you're that Messiah guy, right? And he's like, yeah, shh, don't tell. He's constantly keeping it a secret. He refuses to seize power by fame. And finally, the Satan shows him all the kingdoms of the world, all the power of politics and empire, and says... I can give it to you. You can seize this. Take it. And Jesus says, no. I will not win by political power. I will not win by force of military conquest. I will win through a cross. And he does. And the great irony here is this is the way in which he is exalted. We face the same temptations, church. We are tempted to take control of resources. I've, I've been to uh, homeless ministries before where they, they will not give people food unless they listen to a sermon or sometimes even unless they uh, actually like convert. <laughs> We are tempted to put on a good show, to show people. We are tempted to seize political power and take culture by force. To that, Christians, I say that that is not the mindset that Paul calls us to. That we are instead to find our true exaltation, our true victory, just as Christ did through cruciformity, through conforming ourselves to the crucified image of Christ.
Church, to be Christian means to be like Christ, which means you will be taken advantage of. It means not seizing power, but rather giving it up. It means not fighting for your rights, but through humbly seeking the betterment of those around you. We are not warriors. We are good neighbors. That is what it means to be cruciform. And church, lest we think to ourselves, oh silly God, oh silly Jesus, that's not the way the world works. That, won't, that will never work. We have to take power. Friends, I remind you that the person of Christ transformed this world more than anyone, and he never held office. He never seized power. He was a good man who taught people a different way to be human and sacrificed himself. By that humbling act, he transformed the world. Guys, civil, if you study the ancient world, it was a hard place to live, right? Civil rights didn't exist before Jesus. The, the word humility was not considered a virtue before Jesus. And yet since his arrival, since his death, since his resurrection, the world has been transformed into a very different place. When Christ was on the cross, the religious leaders at the time in the Gospels mock him and say, look, look at him. He saved others, and yet he cannot save himself. And here is the great, great irony of that passage, is that in a strange way, they're right. Jesus saved others and yet could not save himself, not because of lack of power, like, I mean, he was God. If he wanted to, like, beam down a whole bunch of strength and just flex his way off the cross, I'm sure he could have. No, he could not save himself because it was not within his nature. We serve a God that fundamentally does not save himself but looks to the interests of others. And that is the unifying factor that Paul calls the Church of Philippi to. And Covenant Community Church, that here today is what the voice of Paul that looks upon us from the great cloud of witnesses, he still calls us to. Be united in mindset. Let that mindset be the cruciform mind of Christ that does nothing out of vain conceit or rivalry, does nothing out of a spirit of just opposition, but seeks the betterment. Let us pray. Cruciform God. God who became one of us, that we may become like you. We know that we have your mind, but God, may we, by unifying together, by not dividing based upon ideas or parties, may we be united in humility and in our approach to those around us, counting others more significant than ourselves. God, give us, give us this. Help us to seize that which is ours in you, that which you went to the cross to give us, that we might go to our own crosses in order to give to others. God, embody 
your mind in this way in our lives. We pray this in the name of the cruciform God. Thank you, Pastor Jordan. All right, church, as we go to the last song, I invite you guys to please stand and to sing Your Love Awakens. We are no longer bound, no longer bound. You call me out of the grave, you call me into the light, you call my name, and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Feel the darkness shaking. All the dead are coming back to life. I'm back to life. I hear the song awaken. All creation singing, we're alive. Cause you're alive You call me out of the grave You call me into the light You call my name and then my heart came alive Your love is greater Your love is stronger Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me Your love is greater Your love is stronger Your love awakens, awakens Awakens me And what a love we found Death can hold us down We shout it out We're alive Cause you're alive And what a love we found Death can hold us down We shout it out We're alive Cause you're alive And what a love we found Death can hold us down We shout it out we're alive, cause you're alive. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love awakens me. Your love is greater, your love Stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Can you believe these gentlemen right here actually spend their time to devote to uh, give us this great? Uh, songs that we get to hear. So let's give them a hand again. Thank you, guys. We have uh, two great things in your bulletin today that we want to talk about. One starts today and one starts this spring. Uh, the first one is the financial piece. It starts today at 1115. Lunch will be provided. Uh, it does cost $45, but I know that what you're going to get out of this is uh, something more important than anything else right now. The other thing is, is this spring, we're going to start repaving the parking lot and getting it striped. So 
Um, we've raised 15500 so far, and uh, Session has blessed us and said, hey, we're going to throw in the rest of the money and uh, get it accomplished, make it look nice for uh, other people coming in. Um, one of the things is I wanted to thank Mark for the poster that we, uh, we have up there on the board. He actually got it printed out for us. Thank you, Mark. And uh, again, we're ready to uh, get this place looking nice again. And um, we'll give it over to Pastor Jordan. Thank you, Dan. Uh, well, now is the time in the service where uh, we... Uh, typically have our uh, tithes and our offerings. Um, and so if, if there are a variety of ways in which you can give, and thank you for all for your generosity and helping raise funds for, for the parking lot and just for making ministry here in general happen. It is uh, so important, and so thank you so much. You've been very generous, and we thank you for that. Uh, there are a variety of ways to give. You can give online. You can give via text. You can also give via snail mail in the good old-fashioned United States Postal Service. And uh, we'll get the check that way and take it down to the bank and deposit it, and uh, the money will then be routed to our account. It's an old-fashioned way, but it's, I like it. With that, let's pray for the morning's tithe and offering. Uh, blessed Father, we thank you uh, for the gifts that we have been blessed with, God. We thank you that you're a provider who cares for our needs, God. Uh, Lord, in the book of Job, uh, you remind us that you, you care for all of creation. You, you call Job and you, you show him the mountain goat and you say, I'm here when the mountain goat gives birth. No one else is here, but I am, God. And Christ picks up this theme in, in Matthew and says, how much more so if God cares for these animals, does he care so for you and meet your needs? We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you that you meet our needs, both individually and as family units, but also corporately together as a church. You meet our needs, and we are so thankful. And God, we, in light of that thankfulness, we, we long to take care of one another in this body and in this congregation. And so we bring our gifts, we bring our offerings, we bring our tithes, and ask that you would bless them and do more with them than we ever could. In your son's name, amen. Church, would you please stand for the benediction? Church, sisters, brothers, go in cruciformity. Go united in a world that is divisive. Go not in a spirit of adversary, but in a spirit of humility. Count others more significant than yourselves. And have the mind of Christ, the mind that is self-emptying, that will not fight for itself but for others through love. Go in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Awakens, awakens, awakens me.